We acknowledge that you are here. It wasn't your country to take. Is it your country? It's all of our countries. But it's acknowledge not your it's, not it's all of ours. And then there's us, the Boers. We don't take part in this, and we're not going to. And we're not going to go away. And we're the rightful owners of this land. <laughs> so is a multicultural society. In 1994, Mandela made us believe that we were also a rainbow nation, united in our diversity. But today, our politics, our life experiences, even our social circles seem once more to be defined by race. It seems like the Rainbow Nation project has failed. Why? With me to discuss this, Kayat Langa, marketing guru, columnist, currently senior communications manager at Coca-Cola South Africa. Sisongim Simang, a scholar and activist who writes about race and gender justice. Sunet Bridges, Africana musician and activist with Red October, the protest movement made popular by Steve Hofmeyer. Pierre DeForce is constitutional law scholar. And Lebu Mashile, award-winning poet. And in our audience, we have South Africans from all walks of life. Welcome to you all. You. Now, before we ask, has the Rainbow Nation failed? Take a look at this. In our marketing hype, we've been living in the Rainbow Nation for years. But in the real world, Achieving reconciliation and creating a society in which everyone has an equal stake was never going to be easy. We, the, the first democratically elected government of this country, made the reconciliation one of its main planks. Had we not done that, those elements, the right-wing elements that, that wanted to stop the election by force, probably would have triumphed. 20 years on, South Africa is a middle-income country, but inequality between races is growing. Black people are five times more likely to be unemployed than whites. Racism is not only experienced in the form of poverty and unemployment. It also persists in the social divisions and in people's attitudes. Gloria Kente has been a domestic worker and a nanny for most of her working life, a job that takes her away from her family six days a week. In 2006, her employer's partner started abusing her verbally. He called me kafir, a pathetic kafir, and then he, he just grabbed me the other day with my pyjamas and he spit on my face. And he kept calling me kafir, I'm a pathetic kafir, I'm, I'm a thief, I'm stealing their land. In 2008, Gloria laid a charge, but her abuser merely paid a fine and continued to taunt her. And then he always said, say to me, I'm acting like a white woman. I forgot that I'm a black. With help from the South African Domestic Workers Union, Gloria is taking her case to the Equality Court. I'm happy to do this because I know there is a, a lot of people that are living in this thing, but they don't want to come out because we don't want to lose our jobs. Racism is not limited to the poorest South Africans. Yes, I'm calling about the property that you had uh, advertised on. Um, Sipoma Sonda is a university graduate. When he tried to rent a flat, he was shocked by the response. But I called this guy who was so bold, he just decided to tell him that, look, this, the flat is not available to, to, to non-whites, quoting him verbatim. Masonda is a journalist at City Press. He and his colleagues decided to conduct a survey to test if there was racial discrimination by rental agents and landlords. I think I found about seven. Out of the seven, um, the five were fine with it. But out of the seven, there were two which were Afrikaans advertised, uh, adverts, rather. So I phoned the Afrikaans adverts. Um, I was bluntly told that the places had been taken. Like five minutes later, Yvonne phoned. She spoke Afrikaans and um, asked for the places. One of them told her um, the place is still available. She can come in at four and view the place. The other one said, no, the place is, is freely available. She can just come in and, and, um, and um, get the place if she wanted it. Black South Africans are not the only ones who feel they are targets of discrimination. Following the killings of white farmers, Steve Hofmeyer and other prominent Afrikaners 
established a protest movement called Red October. Have made a really big hoo-ha about the fact that if white people get together, it's racist, and if white people get together, they're far right wing, and you are wrong. Red October is a international march from seven or eight countries, about 58 marches. Lots of them, I suppose, from expats that used to live here, that moved for various reasons, to let the world know that our state gives us a deaf ear when we tell them that there is a minority of us still here who refuse to acclimatize to the substandard of life expectancy. Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu believes that white people need a different kind of leadership. Kayadlanga, let's just admit it. The Rainbow Nation has failed. The whole idea of non-racialism 20 years on a pipe dream. In fact, we should blame you marketing guys because you came up with it and then you exploited it for your own commercial game. No, no, I, I don't think that marketing, uh, you know, came up with it. In fact, it was Archbishop Tutu who came up with it. And Remember, you exploited and it. he was like, the <laughs> rainbow nation of, yes. you know, that's, yeah. he called the And then the you phrase. exploited it. I, I, I'm not even going to talk about marketing. <laughs> I can understand what Mandela was trying to do, what, you know, Archbishop Tutu and them were trying to do, but you are not going to get that done in, in like five years, 10 years or 20 years. Because when you used to sing a black person as a garden, a garden boy, your whole life. And you are not used to seeing a black person as an intelligent person who can think for themselves, who can produce and do things. Then you are not likely to accept them as someone who's equal to you. So Sangam Samang, it's a long-term project, right? So we must just be patient. No, I think that uh, the concept of being patient assumes that there isn't an urgency to it. So while at the same time, I think we all recognize that non-racialism is the work in progress, we need measures now that address the very real situations in which people are living. Uh, we cannot accept, uh, as Archbishop Tutu says, that because of the color of your skin, you will be born, uh, you will live a, a certain kind of life, and you will die in that same station. My children uh, go to a nursery school, and in that nursery school, there's not a single one of the preschool teachers who is not white. And there's not a single one of the teaching assistants who is white. So the message every single day for those women there is a ceiling, and until this changes, you will never get this job. Sinead Bridges, why do we need a Red October movement? I mean, we have 30 million black people in this country who don't have a plate of food. Wouldn't it be better for you to fight that? Would that not make you a little bit more secure, as you heard from Desmond Tutu, um, that white people in this country are lucky? I don't agree with what Desmond Tutu said, firstly, at all. And I don't think we can prescribe to tell people what they can and cannot march for. People become involved in projects and march for things that are important to them. There are people marching six marches per day in this country, violent ones. And then it is very easy to make an insert, like the one that was played before the show, where what, the fact that there is white poverty is completely denied, ignored. <laughs> I, in fact, don't think that most of the people here know that there are white squatter camps. So why not partner then with the other people who are in squatter camps who are fighting for similar things to those white South Africans who live in squatter camps? Well, why segregate yourselves? No, part of the Red October was, uh, had to do with um, affirmative action, broad-based black economic empowerment. These are discriminatory laws. There are one million people, white people, left in the job market in South Africa. So even if you took every single one of their the jobs, <laughs> if you took every single white job away from them and gave all of those one million jobs to a black person, then you will just have a million more white people that are poor. But no one's asking for one million jobs to be taken away from it, but white it people. it is happening. It is in fact no, happening. But no one's asking for it. No. It seems to me the height of self-indulgence mm. for white people to go on and on about affirmative action <laughs> in, in the face of so many very real and pressing national problems. And I think part of what's going on with the affirmative action kind of hang-up that white people have is it's the one area since, uh, you know, democracy came where white people were forced to not be allowed 
to state their case and to win that particular fight. Mm -hmm. And so part of how racism works is that we view white people's pain as more important than black people's pain, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Sinead? No, th that's, that's not true at all. Um, you view us um, as thinking that our problems are more important and then we think that you think that your problems are more important. And that's the problem that we have. And, uh, can I finish, please? Um, because you and I should have coffee and then you can sort out your personal issues with me. Um, I'm not denying that there are hectic problems in this country that need to be addressed. But we can also not deny the fact that very many of these problems are service delivery, maintenance problems due to kind of deployment, affirmative action. Because people have been put into positions that they are not qualified to do, and the country exactly. is falling apart. Exactly. Yeah. When we talk about these things, it always seems to me that the reality of living in South Africa passes some people by, like Sunet. And you can throw out certain statistics, like 18% of white people live in so-called squatter camp. Whatever have you ever been to a white squatter camp? <laughs> If you actually follow statistics that are scientifically taken, then you see, for example, that after one year of graduation, a white graduate is about 10 times as uh, likely to have gotten a job than a black graduate. Why is that? Absolutely. But there is the reality of hundreds, if not thousands, of white farmers being killed on their farms. We can't ignore it. If you are a black person living in Kailicha, your life is far more at risk than any white person living anywhere. Exactly. Me as a middle class white exactly. person driving in a car, the threat to my existence for crime is far, far less than if you are a poor and black person because of the way in which apartheid structured our society. In terms of the insight that you've, you've given and so on, uh, you talk about racism against black people. You also uh, talk about white farmers being killed. Whilst there's no mention that the second largest population group in this country, not being white, them being colored, is so neglected, we've got the highest incarcerating rate. So we are so, so, so caught up between a white, black debate and so on. And this ideal, the zebra debate, this ideal where we want to grow to in terms of a rainbow nation is so to say denied because we are leaving behind the people who are regionally in this country. Let me ask you this. Um, when the racial categorizations are made in this country under, for example, black economic empowerment, employment equity, colored people, fall under black people. Why do no. you feel the need? No! No! no. Yes, yeah, let, let me finish my point and then you can respond. Why you feel you must hold on to that identity and why it then leads to the exclusion that you're talking okay. about? <clears throat> there, there can be many reasons, but the, the sole reason is we are a social construct in this country. Secondly, constitutionally, we have the right to associate us with whomever we want to. Yes. We are colors. <laughs> There's nobody representing us here. I'm ask, just asking for fairness. I'm saying if we are really serious about speaking about racism, let us give each other a fair chance. Let us say there must be a black person, there must be a colored person, a white person, an Indian person. But you can't say let's talk seriously about racism, but you exclude us. All right. Dr. Mulder, if you could stand up for me. The Rainbow Nation is in trouble in serious trouble. When we started the constitutional writing process in 95, I was present as a member of parliament. An ad was put out to the public to say, what is South Africa about? It said, at that time, 20 million women, 18 million men. Eight religions, 25 church denominations, 31 cultural groups, 14 languages, nine race groups, one country. And if you look at the audience today, that is the reality of South Africa. The question is, how do we deal with that reality? How do we take South Africa forward and create a society where we can live in peace and harmony and take our country forward? Now, my fight is not so much with our friend from Coca-Cola. My fight is with a friend from South African breweries. The impression is created of this wonderful rainbow nation. We see that every Saturday in sporting advertisements. The true problem is that the recipe for nation building in South Africa is wrong. We cannot stumble from one sporting event to the next and think we're going to build a nation in terms mm. of people feeling that they belong, that they are accommodated. That's why the Minister of Sport reacted so terribly about Bafana Bafana. Yeah. 
calling them useless idiots. Why? He hoped that they would win the cup and the ruling party can ride on that sentiment until the election. That's what he hoped. <laughs> Do, you, do Indian people feel the same way as, as colored people, that they are excluded, that they are a separate group and should be dealt with separately? Well, I don't know. I'm not here as an Indian person. I'm here as a black South African woman. The problem, I think, is that um, in the first few years of our democracy, the ANC had a discussion which they called the national question about how it deals with the question of race. But as time went by, after the Mandela presidency, the ANC abandoned that because there were other priorities in the country, and rightly so. And what you then had is people retreating into their lagers. So what you have is, is people like Sunet and um, uh, my black brother across there who believe that they are different. And um, there is no intelligent debate in this country other than what we're doing now on how to deal uh, with these issues and how to help people like this to see that they, their problems are no di different from everybody else, uh, else's problems. And that um, when, you, when you talk about squatter camps in this country, it's more to do with class rather than um, a few people, you know, that, that feel that they need to be treated differently and that their problems need to be treated differently. All right. Well, I don't know. It's a, it's a huge project, yeah, this. Building this country, not fighting with each other and not pointing fingers. Why are we not in this together? I think the defining chord that runs through South African identity is the sense of exclusion. If you're poor and black, you feel excluded. If you're white and your ancestors were colonialists, you feel excluded. If you're multiracial, if you're colored, then and your ancestors were slaves and colonialists, you feel excluded. Everybody in this country feels like they're being pushed out of the box of South Africanness. Our country was built on 350 years of systemic violence, systemic violence, misogyny, and the exclusion of people. When we start to deal with the emotional, <laughs> emotional, psychological, and spiritual baggage of that, then we'll start to form a country, we'll start to form a nation. But that is real, deep, inner, emotional, loving work. We need to start speaking from a place of, uh, from a place of love for self, from a place of love for our children, from a place of wanting this society to be what we imagine it to be in our minds, in our dreams. We've got to want something better than what we have now and want it more than we want to be right. Of course, there's a resource problem. Mm. But in essence, the whole question, why can't we just get along, sit in a circle and sing Kumbaya? <laughs> it is all about power. Who has the power? And yes. power is not only whether you have political power, it's whether you have economic power, yes, resource, yeah. whether you have social power. If you have a white skin in a racist society, you have more social power. And it's a nasty concoction of things that makes it very difficult for people to come together as equals. Now, so are you admitting then that by virtue of having a white skin, that you have a level of power that I, with my black skin, wouldn't. I do, I, socially. For example, if I, go, if I go into a shop, I know that no matter if I come from the gym, if I go to the gym and I'm dressed scruffily, nobody's going to assume that I am somehow up to mischief. If I'm a black person and I go to the same thing, people are going to assume it. I wonder whether we're willing to seed our eyesm, our coloredism, our Indianism, our blackism, our whiteism, our Africanism, in the interest of an African identity, which is something that I think is far more compelling than the kind of silos that we are trying to construct. I think that there's no getting away from the fact that the project of apartheid was very linked with white capital expansion. I think it would be more useful to frame our conversation around rather affirmative action, corrective action, because what are we doing? We are correcting what has gone wrong. Reconciliation is not just about, mm, I'm so sorry, I love you, you love me. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Sunet. Embracing your African identity, please speak to that first before you make the other points. Yes, absolutely. We started this conversation with regards to the Rainbow Nation. You, there cannot be a rainbow if we do not embrace the fact that we are several different cultures, we speak different languages, we have different traditions, 
And that was the plan, is for each of those to be preserved so that together it will be a really nice picture. But it all just became one big grey mess and majority takes everything. And you cannot deny that. You cannot deny the fact that tribalism is alive and well and I actually think it's a good thing. I mean, Zulu people have, they own 37% of Natal in the Ingonyama Trust and nobody knows that the Zulus have an entire homeland in the brand new South Africa. But let them have it if they want, but then give it to us as well. I want to stay with this point about the rainbow and everybody having their own peace. And maybe you want to speak to that because you want to raise the issue of the koi. Yeah, I just want to start by saying a question. Did the rainbow nation fail? It was never successful because it was never reality. You see, since Codessa, this was a black and white talk. You've, you've sidelined us. So are you saying that there were no colored people, no koi people around the table at no, Codessa? We are, we, are not, we are not included. We are not even like, like it's here. No, they were well, you have, there. You, see, you have seats. There's you have seats for white and blacks. Sir, could we stick with the topic, please? At Codessa, there were colored people. There were people of koi descent. No, this is not a rainbow nation. We are the rainbow nation, the ones who are being pushed aside. The rest is a zebra nation. Uh, Teresa, I want to go into our workplaces because we've talked about, the insert specifically looked at your overt um, racism. But we're working in the same uh, environments, right? We're all in the same offices. How are we interacting? Pretty negatively, unfortunately. I mean, after 20 years, one would have hoped there would have been more progress in terms of integration. You know, if I look back 20 years when we first started doing this work, there was definitely far more overt racism. I find it's now a far more, far more covert thing. It's as if we can't talk about race, especially as white people. And until we have this discussion, especially in the workplace, until we negotiate and talk to each other, we're never going to build unity. This is our 20th year of democracy, and we're still hearing about me and my white and my, sorry, red October movement, and me and my little <laughs> colored thing. Why can't we be united? But, but so we need to educate yeah. each other. But it isn't what Sinet saying is that we need, she's talking about the rainbow, but she's saying everybody in there needs to have their own space, and she feels that they don't have their own space. In well, this I think that, you know, they, we have so much space as white people. We have benefited hugely, and we still benefit every day from apartheid. It's nonsense to say we don't. Part of what happens in these conversations, and I spent many years of my life working on gender issues and working as a gender trainer. And so you'd come and have a discussion about what men and women and how women have less power than men. The men in the room would say, but you're not acknowledging the places where you have improved. And it would make feminists, myself included, feel very defensive. But the reality is that if I am not able to acknowledge that as a black person who has um, one of the most fantastic educations in the world, has access and political networks and walks into a room with confidence and will get the CEO position regardless of affirmative, ac affirmative action, right? Mm. If I don't acknowledge that I have power, right, then we're not having an honest conversation. And then yes. Sunet and my brother over here get upset because the reality is there has been an increase of some black people's power. Mm. There has been a new black elite that has formed. So should we then change the way that we do black economic empowerment, change the way that employment equity is done? Maybe. So me and you, Ma who have already benefited, no longer benefit from What it. I'm saying, so I believe in affirmative action, yeah. okay? Because I'm also not, I, I'm not a black person who is so individualistic as to say, my power and my access means that no one else must have. What I am saying is that a mature conversation on race also recognizes there are different types of power yes. and that there are shades and nuances in the conversation about power. And when I can accept my own privilege that in a new South Africa, the cachet of being an articulate black person has a certain type of power, if I can accept that and acknowledge mm. that, then I can have a conversation with Jeanette yes. because I've given a little bit of what she's talking about. And then I hope she can also hear me. Right? You agree? I, I, I agree very much with what she's saying. Um, I think it's about owning the truth of 
your own story with all of its complexity. So for me, as, as again, as an educated middle-class woman, I know that when I walk into spaces, I, I, I carry a certain currency that is not carried by my brother who can't pee in a toilet that I peed in when I went to Vits, exactly. you know? Exactly, exactly. But at the same time, I also acknowledge that when I do walk into spaces, for example, going into very poor disenfranchised communities, I also have to acknowledge that the dysfunction that I see that exists in those communities is part of my historical baggage. I carry it within me. It's in my family, it's in my heart, it's in my choices. And what is worrisome is seeing people who own so much power in terms of land, in terms of resources, in terms of people you employ, in terms of the language that, you, that you've taken from these people and used to create a nation. You own so much power, but do you concede that? Do you acknowledge that? Do you own that? If, if you own a little bit of that, it would be easy to come to the table with you. It would be easy to acknowledge death is death, pain is pain. I mean, there were 350 years of conscription in this country. It's only one generation of, Af of, of white men who didn't go into the military. How much pain exists in white families? I'd be willing to, I'd be willing to hear that more than I'm willing to hear that your pain is your pain only only because everybody in this room is carrying pain. But I don't, I don't believe the debate from our side. 20 years into this democracy, the debate from our side has never been to negate your pain, nor has it ever been about saying that we want back to where we came from. White people voted for this democracy. No, they didn't. Yes, they did. No, they didn't. Yes, they did. No, they didn't, Sissy. No, we, they didn't. Yes. A handful. In, a handful. In, a handful. In, did, any of, did you vote ANC in 1994? I'm not talking any about the ANC. Please listen. In 1992, white people had a referendum to decide whether they're going to allow the vote. And we gave the vote because we thought that what was it happening wasn't was yours wrong. to give. Do you acknowledge that? It was not your country to take in the first place, but we acknowledge the fact that you are here. We acknowledge that you are here. It wasn't your country to take. Is it your country? It's all of our countries, but acknowledge it's all of ours. People wearing this beret are saying we don't belong here. Okay, no one can hear you at this point, so I'd like to actually have a conversation okay. and I'll ask for tolerance in this room, please. Tolerance. All right, Sinet? What I'm saying is that I don't think the problem is with people on the ground, even the people sitting here. People who govern and politicians are determining the success of what is happening on the ground. Right. We have rhetoric where people go on stages and say the colonists must go and, the, and we stole the land and we stole the mines. The, the Brits took the mines. Buddha never had mines. You know, and, and we can't keep on having that rhetoric and move forward. Every time I switch on a television or I put on a radio and Julius Malema says that we don't belong here and what is happening? <laughs> it's a problem. You cannot preach reconciliation to one segment of the country and preach empowerment to the other segment. All right. There's a vast, there's a vast difference between and I agree with you. There's a vast difference between rhetoric that's used to manipulate the population yes. and sway people and the truth. Ne? And I would be interested in hearing how white people process the emotional baggage of what their ancestors did. I would be interested in trying to understand what it did to white families. How much silence did white people have to cope with? How did white people build a shield around themselves to be able to deal with the system in which whiteness operated all these years? That's an emotional conversation. That's a delicate conversation. I'd be willing to do the work of trying to unravel that because right now as a black person, I'm trying to do the work of unraveling my own baggage, my own historical baggage. I think when white people start to do that work, then we'll start to begin the project of trying to understand how all of us belong to this place. But you can't erase history. We can't pretend the violence didn't happen. We can't pretend colonialism didn't happen. We can't pretend people weren't slaves. We can't pretend our people are not poor. 
It happened. It happened. I'd be willing to hear white people say, you know what? It was cuck trying to pretend that this situation was normal. But I'm not hearing white people do that work. All right. What? There's a lot of anger. There's a lot of... I don't, I don't hear hope yet. I don't know about you, but I don't hear hope yet. I hear it. I hear it. Just us being here, having this conversation together, getting to a space that we need to get to as a nation, it will take a very long time. It's not child's work. For me to sit and listen to Sunet, listen to Pierre, listen to Sisonke and to Lebo, and hear the various voices and digest the message that comes from them, I feel pained. I, I feel their pain. But at the same time, I feel there's hope because we're talking about it. We put a plaster on a gunshot wound in this country. That's what we did. And that needs to stop. We need to, we need to talk to each other and then come to a space of understanding. Is, you're with the EFF. Yes, I am with the EFF. Explain that to me. Well, I explain in a simple fashion that <clears throat> in this country we've got more than 70% of the nation that's living in utter poverty. And if you go into the townships and, and especially in the squatter camps and you see how our children are living, we're talking about kids. We're not talking about black, white, color. We're talking about kids. So when I look at economic freedom fighters, we are looking at changes in this country to bring it into a social system where there will be no class, where the state can take control and we can live in a society where everybody can be brought up to the same level. The, the thing of, of the Rainbow Nation that did not work, yeah. reconciliation can only work if we both reconcile. You cannot have Nelson Mandela giving forgiveness for a racist group of people that oppressed black people in the apartheid era and say, let us forgive them. They don't come forward and say, yes, we accept your forgiveness. Let's reconcile with mm -hmm. each other. Mm -hmm. They don't do that. <laughs> we still have people in the audience here. We still have people in the audience here, like a gentleman there, when, when, when she was talking about uh, the black people being uh, more educated and can actually uh, contest for a position. I had a comment says, yeah, let's kill them. Mm -hmm. It's those comments that makes people to be killed on farms also. Because when you undermine a black person in this country longer, they are going to kill you. I'm Myrtle Vetpui and I'm from the South African Domestic Workers Union. It's not about color. It's not about whether I'm a colored. It's whether I'm a human being. Yeah. And I think we need to do that. Do you know the pain of a domestic worker? Do you know what it is to be isolated in the backyard of employers? To sit there when the employer go out with their beautiful cars and I remain in the backyard, I was there in the apartheid years. Mm. But one man came out and he forgave. And that time, when I was in the struggle, I did not say I was a colored. Yeah. I did not say Mandela is black. We were fighting for freedom. <laughs> that is what we were doing. I did, I, did, I did not classify myself as a colored. And when Comrade Mandela came out, he said there's black and there's white. And since that day, I walked that path. I am black. And I am, and I am proud of it. If we want to free ourselves, we must free ourselves from this color thing. We're not going to become free because we are better. We are oppressed even in our working place. Uh, our employers don't recognize us. We raise the children. Yeah. But you find that at the end, you dismiss, you are stealing, you, my paint is missing, my sugar is missing. <laughs> There's a, 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 a certain amount of people which wants to create a nation of unity. And then there's us, the Boers. We don't take part in this, and we're not going to. And we're not going to go away. And we're the rightful owners of this land. <laughs> so, uh, uh, So that doesn't mean we doesn't see the sunshine over other people, okay? If you go back in history, you would 
actually see that the Boers have negotiated with the tribal chiefs and the kings, and we, we have, we have uh, seen them as equal, and we have uh, given them their, their uh, peace. Okay? Uh, now, now, carry on, we can hear you. If we want to uh, share one country, we must first accept the realities. Help me understand something. If we're going to live in the same country, but you don't want unity, how do we do it? We, we never wanted unity. No, 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 I, I, I accept what you're saying. Okay. I accept that, that's what you said. Yes. What I'm saying is, then how do we live in one country? Oh, that's very easy, okay? We can uh, live in this country happily if we have proper borders. So if, if the Boers have their land, mm -hmm. and the Tswanas have their land, and the Zulus have their land, we do not want to mix leaf Jobek for the cosmopolitans and all this uh, type uh -huh. like, like... Sounds like horse. a party, yeah, Properly, yes. Okay. All right. Then, Let me hear what my panelists have to say. Mr. Langa? Uh, Hiya. Five minutes. Hiya. Why did you give me 30 seconds? Down. Sit down. You me. Yes. Only these two. This is intimidation. Uh, Side of your blood no. Then leave. Because we have you. I'm not going because you say I'm going. I don't care. Please leave. Please leave. Please leave. Please leave. Please leave. Please leave. First and foremost, we are human. We are people. We happen to have color. And I think that is the one crucial thing we always forget. At the end of the day, we all bleed, we die, we get hungry, we hurt, we're in pain. And the issue really comes when we start comparing each other's pain, that my pain is worse than yours. And I think what's happened today, uh, we've had some very heated discussions, we've had some people leaving, and I think that's, been, that's perfect, because it means we are starting to be honest with ourselves as South Africans. So what's happening, when people are not ready to deal with the reality and the truth, they will go away. But at some point, they're going to have to come back. And I wanted to actually ask the young man over there who says that, like, you know, like there needs to be like a separate place for the Boas, the, you know, the Zoanas and all that. How do you feel if uh, your daughter decided to marry a black man? How would you feel about that? I cannot see that happen. Uh, no, I'm saying uh, if she wanted to. No, then it's her choice. Then she go off in life with her choices and she live with it. I don't uh, see you as a lesser person. I only see you as a different person than my culture. And I love my own. When you're looking at uh, the South African uh, coat of arms, it talks about diverse people unite. It is not a suggestion, it's, it's a command. It's like diverse people unite. And I think we actually forget that this is what we're supposed to do as South Africans, that we're supposed, yes, the acknowledgement of our diversity is there, but we have to unite All right. in our diversity. So Sanke, the reality of South Africa is what happened in the studio. The colored community is also a minority group and their rights are being ignored, in, and even in the Cape, where they were the first people there. When we did Red October, which people still criticize us for, it was about minority rights, and in the Cape, the coloreds and the Malay people took part. We do not have a democracy, we have a majority rule. Small groups of people are losing their identity, they are losing their cultures. He's asking if, I'll be, uh, if he'll be happy if his daughter marries a black guy. You know what, I know very many black men will not be happy if their daughters marry a white dude. Because you, we should retain our cultures, we should be proud of it, we should uh, keep our languages, our, our traditions. I mean, I, I can't imagine some dude coming to my house and bringing me six cows for my daughter. <laughs> but, you know... No, it'll be, it'll be 50. Oh, 50, 50 cows. My question is based to Sune um, about the Red October. I actually don't understand why white people have tend to be rhinos that you guys are in danger. You need to accept what you have done to the country and you need to sit down and allow us to heal. Mm -hmm. we, we have accepted what you guys have did. Because what is the whole point of this rainbow nation? The guy said, this is their land. This is not your land, sir. You need to wake up from wherever you're dreaming and reality, face reality. Here's a, here's a thing. 
for us going forward, we need to substitute intolerance with love. We are not a people. We are a nation of individuals. If we are a nation, we need to stop tolerating, but we, need, we really need to love each other. It's interesting when I look at your country, which has only got about 11 tribes, while Kenya has about 45. And to be able to put a nation together is quite a mammoth job. And you must admit that uh, 300 years is a long time to undo in 20 years. The question is, what are we going to do? How are we going to implement a program that is going to unravel this over a period of time? As the young people, we are colorblind to begin with. Um, I have white friends, I had colored friends, I have Indian friends, I have friends from all spectrums. And when we get together, the most important thing is enjoying an, an, an experience of euphoria, enjoying an, an authentic experience of love, excitement, you know. We don't care if you're black, if you're white, where you come from. What's important is, is, is what's in here. What can you give me that I can use to grow as an individual? At the same time, what can I give back to you? Yeah. You understand? Now, the thing that is actually happening is quite saddening for a person like me because it feels like um, the older generation is trying to resuscitate a, 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 a apartheid, which is a, a giant that is in a home. We, we, we don't, I don't believe that the Rainbow Nation project is dead. I believe it's limping. Yes. What's important is that as the nation, we need to come together and say, yes, fine, this is where we messed up. How can we work together moving forward? There are some people that are not simply willing to t partake in the project of creating this kind of country that we want. And as young people, which young people have spoken about here, we have to say, if those people are not willing to work towards building the kind of unity that we want in this country, then we must leave them behind. And we must not be apologetic about doing that. But I also want to make sure that when we leave this room, we don't take people that have been saying that they're speaking as somebody as a board or whatever, and assume that they are speaking on behalf of all Afrikaans people in this country, because yes. then it's going to take us backwards. Yes. People will continue to be angry. People will continue to be intolerant for as long as there's these disparities economically. Socioeconomic transformation first, and then questions of, trans uh, of reconciliation of peace will follow after justice. Thank you. When we return, the final word from our panel. Welcome back to the big debate on racism. Let's get the final word now from our panel. When we talk about race and reconciliation like we do today, it often feels to me as if people invent a past that never existed. And I think that it's very important for everyone to be a little bit self-reflexive and to be honest with themselves first. And especially as a white person, maybe with, a, with just with a, a tinge of humility at the same time to think what actually happened in the past. If we don't get to that point of acknowledging what happened in the past and the wrongs in the past, there cannot really be true reconciliation. Thank you. Sinead? I'm, I'm, I'm not the philosophical one and then not doing the nice speeches, I'm a, a realist. <laughs> and the reality yeah. is that after 20 years, this country is in serious trouble. It's burning. And we do not have another 20 years to have nice philosophical uh, discussions about who should be giving what and apologizing for what we need to get on with it and then um, the lady that started her sentence was saying i'm a proud strong sutu woman that's exactly what i wanted her to say i didn't diss her culture i said that's your culture keep keep it and look after it but allow us ours as well because if in this country i start a sentence by saying i'm a proud africana white woman i'm in trouble level the struggles that we are dealing with in south africa are not singular they are global struggles people of color women have been systematically oppressed for centuries the work that we're doing today to try to break this down is is not just important work for ourselves for our continent but it's important work for the world and um, i'm grateful to have been a part of this experience south africans are very passionate we care about our country and it's evidenced by the the nature of the conversation today Thank you. 
uh, it feels like it's, I mean, the subject matter needs something, uh, almost like a moral figure. We don't have Mandela anymore, but someone of that caliber to stand up and say, actually, we're all part of one nation. And those who want to stay behind and live in the past, fine, we will leave them behind. But at some point, they will come and join us because what the, where they live is not feasible. <laughs> One of my favorite poems is by a woman named June Jordan, and she talks about the fact that we are the ones we have been waiting for. And I think that this idea that there are a group of exceptional people who led us to democracy, and now they're gone, and we are sort of left uh, leaderless and looking for someone to replace them is, is deeply problematic. What's clear from this conversation is that everyone is big on vision and very short on details. Yeah. How is it that we are going to create this path to this wonderful future? And what you need for that in part as leaders, of course, but I think you need um, to be thinking about it consistently and constantly. We had the TRC for five years. It wrapped up its work, it's sitting on shelves. Mm -hmm. I think we need to really think about a national initiative where it is somebody's business every single day, in schools, in churches, in communities. Someone must be tasked with the business of thinking through and dealing with racism in all the ways in which it affects our society. Most importantly, the structural ways. Because in some ways, this conversation is a hijacking of the real issues. The real issues are that people are poor, and most of the people who are poor are black. That's it.